The beaches of California are world famous, sun drenched, and filled with life. But they're also environments on the edge, straddling the natural world and unnatural industry. Just off the coast, an impenetrable ridge of high pressure is locking out the rain, parching everything on land. While below the waves, a monstrous blob of warm water is altering the food chain. Mammals and birds by the thousands make their homes on these shifting sands. And adaptation might be necessary to keep the California dream alive on the living beach. Go west, young man. The state of California has long possessed an almost mythical draw. Gathering to its golden coast, those who search for prosperity and the promise of more. California is the most populated state in America and one of the country's largest economic hubs. Its surf and shores are legendary, made famous in songs and movies. But these popular beaches are also gathering grounds for the natural world. Today, they're weathering intense levels of change. Environmental challenges are driving dangerous shifts. Offshore, water is polluted and getting warmer. Inland, there's an unrelenting drought, with sea animals being forced closer to the land and land animals being forced closer to the sea. There's increasing stress on the inhabitants of this living beach. So as you drive along the central California coast, you're driving along one of the most beautiful stretches of Earth. And as it naturally attracts people to recreate, to live, everybody wants to have that ocean view, whether they're on vacation or whether they want to live and look out or retire. People are literally loving this coast to death. What's at risk is exactly what's bringing us to it, the beaches. One hour south of San Francisco, Pescadero State Beach is a long piece of variable coastline. From sands to craggy rocks and back again. California brown pelicans soar above the sun-dappled swells. A shield of fibrous matter welded deep into its breast muscles enables the brown pelican to keep its wings rigid and wide for great lengths of time. It can travel almost 100 miles in a day, if necessary, to reach coastal feeding grounds. The brown pelican is one of the smaller of the pelican species, but even though it's kind of considered a small pelican, its wingspan is still close to you know, six feet in width. So they are, they are a large bird. Today, there are at least 50,000 breeding pairs of brown pelicans in the state of California. But not so long ago, they were on the state's endangered species list. These ones have flocked to Pescadero State Beach for the same reason Spanish settlers did. Pescadero is a Spanish word, meaning a place to fish. On outstretched wings, the brown pelican catches thermal updrafts to conserve its energy. When a brown pelican flies lower on the water, it's conserving its energy even more by making a cushion of compressed air between its wings and the water's surface.
This allows it to skim great distances without tiring. A flock of these birds is called a pouch or a scoop. This is appropriate because one of the pelican's defining traits is the pouch beneath its bill, which it uses to scoop its prey. As they dive into the water and they open their mouth, the large pouch on the bottom of their bill really expands and it can hold a couple liters of water. And then one of the first things they do is they drain that pouch of the water and then they lift up their head and swallow the fish. When fishing, a brown pelican dive bombs the water, coming in steep and fast. The reason this doesn't injure the bird is that it possesses a kind of built-in airbag. Brown pelicans have air pockets in their bones and in the undersides of their bodies. And these help to cushion the water's impact. These also make the bird extremely buoyant, its body floating high in the California surf. Brown pelicans are strong swimmers, moving through the water with the same confidence they show in the air. On land, the bird makes more loping headway, walking on its webbed feet with a pronounced wobble. This rocky colony at the edge of the beach is filled with pelicans and their cousins, the pelagic cormorant. With such abundance today, it's hard to believe that brown pelicans were once nearly eradicated and had to be reintroduced to this area. The brown pelican is actually one of the best conservation stories. They were hunted to low levels in the late 18th century for their feathers, and then they were affected by pesticide poisoning and were pretty much almost extinct in the 70s. Pesticides like DDT threatened the future of brown pelicans. It made their eggshells so delicate they were crushed under the weight of the parents. At the peak of the problem, on one California island out of more than 500 nests, only one successfully hatched. Public outcry resulted in the prohibition of DDT in California and the rest of the United States in 1972. And then once the pesticides were banned and the pelicans protected, this bird has rebounded and they were delisted in 2009. So the brown pelicans are actually doing quite well and we, we hope that they continue to do well in this area. The brown pelican is no longer endangered, but it does retain conservation status. Here at Pescadero State Beach, the colony is thriving. It's breeding season. These wing flaps can be displays of dominance or just to demand a little space. This male is trying to woo a mate. He sways and ducks his head, bowing and turning in a gentlemanly way. Once paired, these birds are monogamous but they only remain that way for a single season. This preening behavior is a way of waterproofing their feathers. 
brown pelicans have a preen gland near the base of their tails. They tilt their heads backward to reach the secretions there and then apply it to their plumage. Keeping naturally oiled allows the bird to shed water from its feathers and keep them in place for optimal flying. This natural oil is a good thing. But then there's man-made oil spills. Like the 3,400 barrels of crude that washed onto these beaches in 2015. Recently, there was the oil spill in Southern California, and I think most of the birds that they rescued were brown pelicans. When a bird gets covered in oil, the problem is the waterproofing. They make sure that their feathers are positioned in the proper way so water can't get in. And once they get oil on their feathers, the feathers start to clump and are no longer waterproof, and they get cold. So oil basically is a death sentence for these birds because they can no longer stay warm. And then when they spend time preening, they end up ingesting the oil. After the accident of 2015, Massive cleanup efforts managed to rescue many coastal birds, including brown pelicans. Pelicans have a fossil record dating back more than 30 million years. But the spilling of fossil fuels is a continuing modern challenge for this species. And it's not the only one to suffer. This common myrrh shouldn't be on the beach. Myrrh spend eight or nine months in the ocean nonstop. They're divers, plunging 100 to 200 feet deep to hunt for fish. This one has encountered oil somewhere, leaving its feathers raggedy and matted. Upon surfacing, it likely pierced through a sheet of oil. The bird's ungainly walk doesn't reflect any injury. It's simply less adapted for land, with feet far back on its body, so it hobbles along on the backs of its legs. Among birds, the myrrh has one of the highest mortality rates due to oil spills. This one won't last long like this. The man-made oil destroys the natural oils from its preening gland. Its feathers no longer waterproof. It cannot dive, feed, or stay warm. Without help, it will likely die soon. The cause and effect between a man-made oil spill and a sick bird is a direct link. But industrialization affects the animal kingdom in many ways, even when the links between cause and effect are less obvious. Humankind contributes to global warming. And global warming contributes to a stubborn new weather system that, in turn, has led to the longest, most extreme drought in this state's history. California has been suffering a drought for at least 10 years and getting progressively worse. Those conditions may be like this for a long time. Meteorologists have nicknamed the weather system responsible for this drought the ridiculously resilient ridge. One of the things that is really causing this drought has been this high pressure resilient ridge that sets up offshore. Lying off the coast is a stationary mass of high-pressure air, almost four miles high and 2,000 miles long. This ridge acts like a kind of great wall, diverting the jet stream and blocking the Pacific rain that would otherwise reach California. So storms that would normally come ashore and provide precipitation are now deflected northward. The longer this ridge refuses to budge, 
the more parched the entire state becomes. This affects both humans and animals. This drought has been sustained for a number of years and, and water supply issues are getting critical. We're seeing terrestrial animals that usually can find water supplies in upper portions of the watershed having to come much lower into the watersheds. Species like mountain lions and bears are starting to have more interactions with humans in the built environment. This is also true for mule deer. Wider foraging brings deer closer to the beach. Here, a family of mule deer wanders along the small gully of Pescadero Creek that leads to the beach. Their search for food and water has brought them perilously close to the highway. Forced to seek food and water beyond their natural inland habitats, more deer have been wandering onto roads and meeting untimely ends. The California Department of Fish and Wildlife has identified the drought as a key contributing factor in these increasing fatalities. California mule deer are their own subspecies, distinguished from other mule deer by their upward forking antlers. These three have no antlers because they're females. A full-grown doe will usually give birth to two fawns in the spring. For the first year of life, these fawns will stay with their mother. Now as the fall lengthens, these two have matured to the point where they've lost their young spots. Mule deer are so named because of their big, mule-like ears, which can move independently of each other, cocking and swiveling at odd angles, ever on the alert. But mule deer have one particularly vigilant sense. It's estimated that they can smell 1,000 times more keenly than a human being. It is also estimated that they can smell a human being from half a mile away. Sensing no imminent danger, this trio returns to its foraging. Turning away, their tails become more apparent. When relaxed, the tails hang down, showing black on top and hiding the white beneath. They continue to look for small berries and flowers, munching away in this drought-burnt scrub. In this dry landscape, the deer are liable to continue toward the beach, following the fresh water that winds beneath this bridge. Where the freshwater creek meets the salty ocean, the water is a brackish mix, important for certain species, like the steelhead trout. But sometimes the creek is unable to complete its journey to the sea. Man-made changes as a result of rebuilding this bridge and irrigation projects have had a negative effect on the steelhead. What happened, as in many human experiments gone awry, is that we've enabled conditions to set up that have resulted in large fish kills. And these have resulted in the listing of the steelhead trout as an endangered species. Steelhead spend their early life upstream in the fresh water at the top of the creek. But at some instinctive point, they swim downstream and enter the estuary. While in the estuary's lagoon, 
the steelhead adapt to saltier, brackish water. This readies the fish for the open ocean. But they have to wait for nature to open the gate. Seasonally, they, this closes off. You can see right here, we're at late summer, early fall, and the, bar, and the sandbar has been uh, built up, closing off the lagoon. In spring, the lagoon rises enough to flood over the sandbar, providing access to the ocean. A steelhead, when it reaches a certain size and the river is reconnected to the ocean, will go out into the ocean. After two or three years at sea, the steelhead will return to Pascadero Creek to spawn. But human development here has disrupted this natural life cycle. In the early 1990s, the state of California had to replace this bridge, and they changed the geometry of the bridge. Many feel that that has altered the way the uh, mouth opens and closes. The new bridge has fewer supports in the water and is closer to the ocean, which may change the flow of water and sand beneath the surface. Tampering with delicate habitats sometimes creates unpredictable results. The sandbar now floods earlier. And sometimes, humans dig channels connecting salt water to fresh. One of the things that the fishermen have done historically on this system, as it gets close, is to try and dig it out. They want the fish to come in and start their migration. The challenge is that when they open it too early, the fish either aren't ready offshore, they haven't pulled up and are trying to get in, or the fish in the lagoon haven't gotten big enough to survive the ocean voyage. Sometimes when humans try to fix a problem, things only get worse. In addition, in 1994, 95, there was a restoration effort which was trying to uh, create more freshwater and saltwater habitats. There was a design that was not necessarily fully engineered, relied on two tide gates that had to be manually opened and closed. And as things do in the marine environment, these tide gates were never really maintained and decayed. These broken tide gates resulted in too much stagnant water. And where there's stagnant water, pond scum vegetation can rapidly take hold. This compromises the water quality for the steelhead. There's a lot of decay and decomposition, and that really starves the water of oxygen. Fish need oxygen in the water to, to live, and so a lot of times the water quality gets very poor. And we've seen since the combination of the bridge replacement and the restoration that there's been a lot of fish kills. What historically were steelhead runs in the tens to hundreds of thousands of fish are down to two or three a year. There are ongoing efforts to save the steelhead trout here at Pescadero. After spawning upstream in 2013, many adult steelhead were trapped behind the sandbar. Unable to escape to the ocean, these fish were suffocating in the oxygen-poor water. Members of the Department of Fish and Wildlife, along with other organizations, staged a rescue operation. Scooping up the steelhead, one by one, lifting them across the sandbar, then releasing them into the greater Pacific. Like a very unconventional form of catch and release. Human intervention is changing the beaches of California. Officials struggle to manage interests that are often in conflict. 
about 200 miles south of Pescadero Creek. Guadalupe Napomo Dunes is a complex that includes a national wildlife refuge. But the animals and scenery aren't the only attraction. The Guadalupe Napomo Dunes region encompasses 18 miles of California coast. Within it are beaches, campgrounds, wildlife zones, and the second largest dune system in the state. Officials here have set aside different areas for different uses, including off-road vehicles tearing up the dunes. As you might imagine, this is not a usual sight to see on a beach. In California, it is the only beach where you can drive and recreate off-highway. Managing the natural aspects of this location, along with all of that recreation, really is a challenge. The Dunes Complex tries to balance the demands of a human parks and recreation area with the more delicate needs of a wildlife refuge. Among the many birds on this beach are the California least tern and the western snowy plover. Both of these small beach waders are listed as threatened and both breed among the sand dunes. As ground nesters, their breeding grounds are particularly vulnerable to off-road vehicles. In a year, we'll probably see about 500,000 vehicles come into Oceano Dunes area. Probably about 1.7 million actual people. But March to September are peak months for these birds to nest here. So during this period of time, visible steps are taken to separate nature from the off-roaders. In order to deal with these two diametrically opposed forces, essentially what they've done is set up fencing to limit the area in which the off-roaders can, can venture. The current routine sees the fences dismantled every October when the breeding season ends. They're removed to allow beach access to the off-road vehicles. But environmentalists are hoping to make these fences a permanent fixture because some snowy plovers might be adapting to the off-road vehicles in a dangerous way. The one thing that's unique about the plovers that live here is we feel that they really have taken a liking to the tire tracks. They kind of nest and roost down into the tire tracks and can watch everything going on around them. So when we take down those fences, we'll continue to see plovers in the tire tracks. Though they live with high traffic, the snowy plovers are actually on the increase here. Because of the fencing and conservation efforts, over the last two decades, the number of nests in these dunes has increased by more than 1,000%. And the dune system itself is showing signs of improvement. And today, as it stands, it's got about 25% more vegetation than it ever had. This complex of protected habitats and recreational areas includes both saltwater and freshwater habitats in close proximity. That lake environment is where we see the amount of biodiversity start to dramatically increase. Just a few miles from the roar of the engines in the fresh water of Oso Flaco Lake, a California species of special concern feeds. The American white pelican is one of the largest birds on the continent with a wingspan that can stretch nine feet. Brown pelicans dive bomb their prey. 
but American white pelicans swim in a herding group. They surround the fish in this lake, steering them toward the shallows. Scooping them from the water and then swallowing them whole. In a state with a population of more than 39 million people, all of California's wild creatures must live in relatively close quarters with human habitation. Sometimes, in the shadow of big industry, it seems impossible for wildlife to persevere. Moss Landing State Beach. It's not just wildlife that uses the water here. To generate power, this plant cycles through more than 1 billion, 200 million gallons of water every single day. Discharging warm water into the bay at the end of the process. But it's in these waters that the endangered California sea otter not only perseveres, but thrives. Also known as the southern sea otter, they were hunted almost to extinction during the 18th and 19th centuries. Its fur was considered so valuable that it was known as soft gold. Before 20th century conservation efforts, it's estimated that the population of sea otters was as few as 2,000 worldwide. Today, these numbers are rebounding, and there are almost 3,000 sea otters in California alone. Moss Landing is one of the biggest concentrations for the animals. The sea otter is one of the smallest marine mammals and one of the only ones without blubber. To compensate, its legendary fur is the densest in the entire animal kingdom. This allows the little otter to cope with cold water living. They tend to lose a lot of heat to the water. They spend a lot of time grooming in order to maintain their dense fur to help them stay warm in these conditions. Not only is their coat dense, it's extremely buoyant. The otters are able to groom while floating on their backs. They manually squeeze water from the fur replacing it then with more air, which traps between the individual hairs making up that fur. The otters have unusually large lungs, which help with their carefree floating. Conserving energy as they rest on the water's surface. Their outer hair is waterproof, and beneath that layer of trapped air, their under fur remains dry. But this isn't the only way sea otters maintain their precious body heat. They actually have to eat a lot of food. They eat about 25% of their body mass um, in food every day. The sea otter has an incredibly high metabolism, eating food and burning calories at a rate to counter its heat loss in water. Sea otters eat mussels, clams, snails, and other invertebrates. When otters barrel roll, it's believed they are spin washing bits of leftover food away from their coats. A 
As coastal animals, they primarily stay in sight of the shoreline. But when it comes time to rest, they do so in communities called rafts. These rafts are separated by sex. Here at Moss Landing, it's just the boys. A lot of times you see males, they do spend a lot of their time napping and resting um, and grooming in this area. Holding their front paws in a prayer posture is also a way of saving heat. It's a gesture that keeps everything tucked in and the body's core warm. Because sea otters are always fighting heat loss, it's possible they're attracted to the warm water from this man-made power plant. Studies using tagged otters are ongoing in order to gauge whether this might be the case. But what's certain for now is that these sea otters consider Moss Landing home. Offshore, the resilient ridge, that mass of high pressure air, has been making its home for years now. In addition to causing the drought, the ridge has also created secondary challenges beneath the waves of the Pacific. Meteorologists call this offshoot problem the warm water blob. The blob, which is basically an ocean feature of the high pressure ridge, is a massive entrenched pool of hotter than normal water. In the summer of 2014, that blob was 1,000 miles long, 1,000 miles wide, and 300 feet deep. The blob, this area of warm water that stations itself in the Pacific Northwest and extends all the way down along the coast, is something that hasn't been seen before in recorded history. All of this is new. The blob has raised California water temperatures by a startling five degrees Fahrenheit. With the blob, it actually causes warmer, calmer conditions. There's less wind because there are less storms because the high pressure ridge keeps things out. Normally, wind churn mixes cold water from the depths with warm surface water, like stirring cream into coffee. This process results in an upwelling of nutrients from the deep. But in the absence of wind at the surface, the nutrients remain trapped in deep water. This affects both the abundance and quality of food available at the surface. Tiny plentiful creatures at the core of the food web, like plankton, react badly to hotter water and can turn toxic. The scarcity of the food causes large animals, like whales, to go closer inshore to feed, increasing their risk of stranding on the beach. And the toxicity of the food can bloom outward, affecting the entire ecosystem. And fish, they'll start to concentrate that toxin, and the toxin will actually move its way through the food web and become concentrated at higher levels. We have animals that are being affected by this toxin. We have a lot of seals that have been um, washing up on the beach or confused seals that come on, onto the beach and don't exactly know what's going on. So yeah, that blob out there is, is really devastating. Though the Pacific Harbor seals' diet and health are directly threatened by the warm water blob, it's still plentiful in California with population numbers higher than 30,000. They are true seals, meaning that unlike sea lions, they have no external ear flaps. 
and out of water, they lack the ability to walk on their flippers. So they flop along on their bellies. The harbor seal gets its name because it doesn't like to travel far from shore. When this coastal animal comes to land after foraging, it's called hauling out. Pacific Harbor seals have spotted coats in a range of colors, from light to dark. They can grow up to six feet long and weigh up to 300 pounds. Like the sea otter, a foraging harbor seal will usually go it alone. But when resting, will tend to congregate in a group. Unlike the sea otter, the harbor seal is thick with blubber beneath its fur, which helps to keep it warm. They fish in shallow coastal waters, hunting for anchovies, herring, codfish, and more. It's not just seals coming to Pescadero and other California beaches looking for lunch. For one predator, it's the seals that are on the menu. There are often times where I'm out surfing in a place like Pescadero that I know that I'm being watched by some big creature underneath me. And sometimes you just have to listen to that and get out of the water. The great white shark. Every summer, more and more juvenile white sharks are appearing in California. Literally just along the beaches, just outside the wave break. And surfers will see them out there, pilots will see them out there. Um, people will see them off our ocean piers. And of course, it freaks the surfers out. What, there's white sharks along our beaches? That, that's not a good thing. The warm water blob is among potential contributing factors for these increases, as is the resilient ridge and other warming patterns. Now, the interesting thing we found the last two winters, we didn't have winter in Southern California. Our water temperatures never got that cold. Interestingly enough, all the sharks that we tagged never migrated south to Baja. They stayed. A population that would normally be migratory wasn't migratory. It's unusual to see great whites so close to shore, but it's happening more often. Sharks are frequent predators of the harbor seals. They could be following the seals in as they pursue fish. We see big adult white sharks along coastal beaches because they're stalking seals and sea lions that are hauling out in those places. It is not uncommon to see sharks, seals, and surfers at the same beach. Understanding the relationship between how we all interact is kind of something that's evolving. In California, the number of people going into the water and the number of white sharks in that very same water are both rising. But what's not increasing in proportion to those two numbers is shark to human attacks. Some people are bitten, but not eaten. What that tells me, we are not on sharks' menus. So even as populations grow, sharks really aren't interested in biting people. More people are heading further offshore. Every year, sports like surfing and kite surfing are increasing in their popularity. So when humans choose to live beyond the living beach in this way, it does mean coexisting with other species. So it's getting people to get past the fear and getting them to accept the fact that when they go in the ocean, it's a wild place. You risk your life every time you go there. But the more you know, the safer you can be. We have to learn to share the waves with the sharks. Learning to share the ocean and the land is key to California's survival and the ecology of the entire planet. In my opinion, life on the living beach has been thrown out of balance for almost 200 years. There is no doubt 
that people have had direct and significant impacts on animals that live on both sides of living beaches. Though people often view themselves as separate somehow, we are an integral part of nature. And we have the unique ability to fix what we affect. We as Californians and as Americans pass legislation to improve the quality of the health of things that we put in the ocean. We reduce pollution going into the ocean. We've reduced overfishing because we, we saw the importance of these things and the impacts that we're having in the ocean. So I think we've actually done a good job at bringing some things back. It's through human conservation that endangered species have been brought back from the edge here. The California sea otter. The California brown pelican. There's a lot of things that are wrong with the ecosystem here on the central coast of California, but there's a lot of positive signs too. Despite the challenges conservationists face on California's beaches, there are finally signs that things are improving. The warm water blob and the ridiculously resilient ridge appear to be breaking down at last. These warm abnormalities that persisted for decades have recently encountered a more powerful force, which may bring an end to the drought. An El Nino is basically a weather pattern where the central Pacific warms up right along the equator. And as it continues to warm, it drives warm water further north, backwards along the west coast of the United States. Now that the strong El Nino's here, we're expecting a lot of rain. If given a reprieve from tough conditions, California can begin to renew itself. The state will have an opportunity now to lead by example, redoubling its efforts to save the creatures and habitats of the living beach.